Hello, welcome to handout 16, which is all about finding the optimum capital structure of entities. We've seen several times this semester that project, a project in general, if it's worth doing, it's worth levering. And what I, what I mean by that is that if you do a project with some leverage, as we saw with our Cowboys versus Conservative and a couple other examples, we can increase our ROE. Good things can happen for owners in good times. But this is a bit of a double-edged sword because it also is always increasing our risk of bankruptcy at the same time. So that sort of leads us to question well, where's the balance? What would be what would be the optimal amount of leverage to put into a project? And in particular, right now, we want to focus on what would be the optimal amount of leverage for an entity to have to maximize its value, either to its shareholders or to all its stakeholders. And that's what the focus of this handout is about. And we're going to learn some methods for determining what the optimum capital structure how much of a of an entity is, i.e. how much leverage should it have. And so let's, without any further ado, let's jump right in. Okay, so let's see how this whole optimum capital structure thing works here for entities. As an overview, we've already seen several times this firm, this term that for the owners of an entity, we when we have increasing leverage, that can help boost the return on equity in good times. But we've seen also if you lever up too much, it increases the probability of bankruptcy in bad times. So that sort of leads inquiring minds to want to ask the question, what's the optimal leverage for a given entity and how should we measure it? And also I would say, how should we try to compute it? So let's start like this. Let's consider a project, uh, should we purchase this entity? So we want to know, as usual, is this going to be an NPV plus project for us? So if we're thinking about purchasing an entity, we're going to own it for a long time, big cash flow at t equals zero is going to be the price we pay for the entity, and then we're going to get a series of free cash flow dividends from the entity. And here you can see, I'm assuming we're not going to sell it. We're just going to enjoy a bunch of free cash flow dividends for a while. And if we think about this from the perspective of stakeholders, very similar, still an NPV kind of project. And now the price paid is what's paid for 100% of the equity, all the shares, plus all the debt. So that would be re assuming we had to refinance all the debt. All the loans would come due and we'd have to find new loans, issue new bonds, that, that type of thing. Um, and then in that case, what we're going to enjoy are the free cash flows available to the lenders and the owners of the firm. And we're going to discount those by the weighted average cost of capital instead of up here the cost of equity capital and in both cases we can maximize the NPV by minimizing our discount rate here our cost of capital the weighted average cost of capital here or the equity cost of capital here and in general the minimum equity cost of capital might not coincide with the minimum weighted average cost of capital for all stakeholders so let's look at first the optimum capital structure for all stakeholders. And what we want to note, first of all, is that we're measuring our leverage by debt over debt plus equity. And this will be, as we've been looking at recently, market value of equity when that's available, otherwise gap value of equity. And I'm here to tell you the optimum leverage ratio measured in this in this way by the debt to enterprise value ratio here occurs when the weighted average cost of capital is minimized. Now remember, this is the case we're looking at for all stakeholders. We'll get back to just shareholders in a bit. So why could I tell you that with such authority? Well, I could be just BSing you, but I'm not actually. It's true, it's true. It's it's, it's really true. Okay, so let's look at the PV total of our free cash flows to all stakeholders. That's what I've focused on here. So I've just taken 
part of our equation here because we're going to we pay what we have to pay for the firm at t equals zero and to refinance the debt and all that jazz I, so that's all at t equals zero there's not much we can do about that so i'm interested in what we can do to improve our second term here and that is going to be the present value of all our future cash flows here so if we look at this equation what we've got in the denominator is the key thing in our denominator is our weighted average cost of capital. So just mathematically, if we minimize the denominator here, we're going to maximize our PV tote for all of our stakeholders, and that's going to give us maximum NPV for this project for all. So that's the key idea. It just comes from mathematically looking at this. The free cash flows that we estimate from the firm, they're going to be what they're going to be based on our assumptions of growth in sales, how much we can cut costs, all that, all that sort of jazz. But the weighted average cost of capital is a function, as we know, of how much leverage the firm has. So minimizing this is going to give us the optimum leverage, the optimum capital structure. So how do we find this minimum weighted average cost of capital that's going to maximize our NPV to all stakeholders? Well, here are the steps. Okay, so first we want to agree, as we sort of alluded to previously, that we want to measure leverage with our debt to enterprise value ratio, right? Debt over debt plus market value of equity, if it's available, right? Otherwise, just gap value of equity. And we can simplify that to D over D plus E. Next up, we want to note that the cost of debt capital and the cost of equity capital both increase with increasing uh, debt to enterprise value ratio, right? And this is true because it's empirically true. As the firm gets more leverage, there's more risk of bankruptcy, which isn't good for anyone, right? It's not good for lenders. It's not good for stockholders. So therefore, as the firm levers up, both debt holders and shareholders are going to demand higher returns on their investment. And that leads to, that's another way of saying, higher cost of capital for the firm. So we're going to have to estimate the cost of debt capital for a given firm and the cost of equity capital at various levels of leverage. And we're going to use market data for RD in particular for the cost of debt capital. And we'll probably use uh, CAPM and Hamada's equation for the cost of equity capital. And we could use something like the opportunity investment model or something like that also. And it would be helpful if it were spelled properly. And then once we've made these estimates for each of these various levels of our WD and WE, in particular increasing WD here, we'll compute the weighted average cost of capital. And we're just gonna look at all of these and we're gonna see which one corresponds to the minimum weighted average cost of capital and that's going to be our optimum debt to enterprise value ratio and why is that true again that's true because when we make this minimum we make this denominator minimum and therefore the present value of all these guys is maximized Okay, so let's jump right into an example. Let's look at Super Consultants Inc. or SCI, and let's find the optimum capital structure for all stakeholders. So what are the key features of this firm? It provides consulting services to small and medium-sized businesses. Sounds good. Uh, stable, steady business with stable future prospects. Uh, these are our usual simplifying assumptions that makes the accounting so much nicer for us. So the key thing here is gonna be slow to know future growth as we saw in the previous chapter that makes everything very simple accounting wise for us it's a well-managed business and right now it's debt free so d over d plus e is equal to zero right right now 
So TTM operating data, how has it been doing for the past year? Well, its tax rate has been 40%, and since it's a stable company, that will be true going forward, has debt equal to zero, as we just noted. Um, all of its revenue is collected immediately. All of its expenses are paid immediately, so that's great. That super simplifies the accounting. There's no accounts receivable no accounts payable, any stuff like that. It's got no PPE, so we don't have to worry about uh, depreciation. And you might be saying, hey, with the, this is too artificial, but it's it's really actually not for this type of consulting company. If you have a consulting company like this, you're renting office space, that sort of thing. It's really It really could be true that effectively you have very low or no accounts receivable, very low or no accounts payable, and definitely you wouldn't have any PP if you're just renting space month to month or something like that. All right, so now let's see how their operations have been doing. So where are we going to look at? The income statement. So they've got 88, let's say million, what the heck, they've got 88 million in revenue in the past year. Let's make this annual. And because, again, it's a steady state firm that was true in the most recent year, it'll be true this year, it'll be true the year after that. So revenue of 88 million, uh, SGA expenses 70, so their EBIT is 18 million. They have no interest, and their earnings before tax is therefore equal to their EBIT. They pay their tax. Their tax rate is 40%, so 40% of 18 is 17.2, and we subtract that from 18 and get 10.8, okay? So that's their net income. So this is pretty, pretty good, more than 10% net income margin. If it's steady and reliable, that's not bad. So SCI CFO, God help her, asks us to find the optimum capital structure of the firm using this minimum weighted average cost of capital method and the corresponding uh, weight of debt and debt cost of capital and equity cost of capital for the firm. So she provides us, to get us started, she provides us with some additional information. The risk-free rate at the time, she believes, is 6%, and she's gone out and measured that by treasuries. Uh, the market rate, this is going to be 4 cap M 4 re the market rate of the stock market on average annual return right now, 11%. She believes the tax rate we've already learned is 40%, and that is tax divided by EBT, where we assume that EBT is equal to taxable income, which has been our assumption pretty much all along. So our strategy to figure this out for the CFO is let's consider one, two, three, four, five, six different levels of uh, leverage measured by debt to enterprise value ratio. Um, and for each one of these levels, what are we going to do? We need to estimate the cost of debt capital and the cost of equity capital. And remember, these are going to increase as our leverage ratio, debt to enterprise value ratio increases. And for each one of these, we will compute the weighted average cost of capital, which we already know how to compute. Here's the formula for it again. And so when we're done, we're going to have weighted average cost of capital for no debt, 20% leverage measured by debt to enterprise value, 40%, 60%, 80%, 90%. And now it's pretty simple. Once we've got all of those, the case with the minimum weighted average cost of capital is going to be the optimum leverage for this firm. And with that in our pocket, we will report that as well as the optimum weight of debt, the cost of debt capital, and the cost of equity capital. Back to the CFO.